I'd like to start with uh, what I think is a very interesting topic in migraine field. It's about pathophysiology and from pathophysiology to drug discovery in migraine. So one of the best things that happen in migraine field is science. And because of science, we have uh, new treatments. So I'd like to start with my disclosures and move to the background of my presentation. So today we're gonna to hear all about migraine attack. And when we define the migraine attack according to the international headache classification, is that either we have a subtype of migraine called migraine with aura. So headache phase is preceded by the focal transient neurological symptoms. It's one third of the population. And the most common subtype of migraine is migraine without aura, when the headache is usually associated with a photophobia, phonophobia, nausea, and sometimes vomiting. We can discuss about the definition of migraine attack, but currently this is the only definition we have, that it starts with aura in case with aura, and it starts with a gradual headache in case of migraine without aura. There are some new studies or emerging debate on other symptoms than the aura and headache with associated symptoms, so-called prodromal symptoms, postdromal symptoms. I'm not going to cover this topic because we have a very interesting debate on this topic. And uh, I will not talk about aura. We also have an interesting presentation on aura in particular relationship between aura and headache later today. I will focus on headache, on the headache phase. And one thing is important about migraine is that migraine is a clinical diagnosis. And because it's a clinical diagnosis, we need patients. And we ask patients about their past history, when the migraine started, the onset of migraine, evolution of migraine is also important, and without classification, we will never be able to diagnose migraine the same way in all the countries that Faisal just showed you. So this is a, one of the great achievements also in headache science is because we have a classification. So it's a clinical diagnosis. And that's why the human status in this context are very important. Well, to understand the migraine, we need to think what is specific for migraine. Well, we know that it is associated with the head pain, and head pain is uh, probably the hallmark of the, of the disease, and this is also the reason that the patients coming to our clinics and they complain of the recurrent headaches associated with the symptoms that I mentioned before. And in this context, the trigeminal vascular system provides an anatomical and physiological substrate for migraine. We have a different compartments in the trigeminal vascular system, and all of them are important. That's probably the interplay between all these mechanisms, which constitute a very complex experience of migraine attack. The trigeminal nerve and the nerve endings surrounding the vessels are very important. Very early studies demonstrated that activation of fibers or irritation of these vessels can evoke a focal pain which very much resembles migraine pain. We also know that the cell bodies are located in trigeminal ganglion and from this place the whole information, the nociception, the susceptive impulses are transmitting to the brainstem in the trigeminal spinal nucleus when the second order neurons relay all the information back to, uh, sorry, uh, up to the thalamus and from the thalamus to the cortical, subcortical areas. And eventually, when the patients start experiencing pain, of course, in this context, the cortex is very important. We also know from the preclinical studies that the activation of the trigeminal vascular system is associated with the release of the different mediators 
and uh, most of them are vasodilators. And we also know that upon the activation of the trigeminal nerve, you also see the release of these mediators from the nerve endings associated with the dilatation of the vessels. This is very important when we talk about how can we study migraine in humans. Well, many years ago, my mentor, Professor Ullison, introduced in a more validated and systematic way a so-called a human model of headache slash migraine. Well, over the past 30 years, this concept evolved, and now we can add different things on this model. So the model usually consists of the double-blind crossover study, when the putative agent is given either intravenously or uh, taken orally, we induce migraine attacks in migraine-free patients. We can record headache, its characteristics, and to see whether they fulfill the criteria of migraine. Since migraine by nature can be provoked by the different uh, triggers, we consider those attacks as a genuine migraine attacks. You can tailor your study by investigating a complex mechanisms of migraine. Let's say if you're interested in brain imaging. So you can combine that either with uh, magnetic resonance imaging or positron emission tomography. It all depends what you want to address. You can do the functional studies. You can collect blood if you're interested in biochemical markers. This provides you a completely controlled situation over the migraine attack, and also you can achieve a homogeneity in a way that all the patients more or less investigated at the same time point, when I say the same time point, on the onset of migraine attack. Or aura, if you're interested in aura. Then you can also see the patients at the end of the migraine attack, at the end of the headache, or you can also um, do the intervention studies when you can administrate the drugs in order to inhibit or to block something what you are interested in. Now, targeting G-protein couple receptors from the human status perspective. Well, here is a signaling pathway responsible for the genesis of migraine attack. So all the data, of course, being collected over the many years from the preclinical models, in particular studies on anatomy, distribution of the receptors, distribution of the molecules or its receptors in the migraine relevant structures. When I say migraine relevant structures, trigeminal vascular system. So here you see the different molecules. You see CGRP, adrenomidulin, amyline, PACA, prostaglandins. And the first focus I'd like to uh, to draw your attention on is prostaglandins. And here in this context, prostaglandin E2 and uh, I2. And the reason for that is the following. When we try to induce headache and migraine using prostanoids, what we saw is that two of the prostanoids induces migraine attacks. Prostaglandin I2 in 50% of the patients. Prostaglandin E2 in 75% of the patients. And you also see that some of the prostanoids been studied only in controls, in healthy volunteers. You see the headache, and whether it induces migraine attack, we don't know. What, what we found interesting in this study is that the PGF2 alpha, which is a known constrictor, many people use it as a constrictor in preclinical studies, doesn't really induce headache. Apparently, you need a vasodilating effect of the prostaglandins in order to induce the headache, but also subsequently migraine attacks in migraine patients. Why PGE2? I will come later to that. But what is interesting about that is about receptors. We have uh, G-protein couple receptors, all of them, and AP1, AP2, AP3, and AP4. And some of them are sharing the mechanisms 
by upregulating a cyclic AMP and the vasodilatory effect of this prostaglandin is associated with the upregulation of the cyclic AMP intracellular. And in this context, we thought that AP4 receptor would be interesting and uh, could be a possible drug target. So what we did, we investigated the effect of the prostanoid AP4 receptor antagonist in the PGA2 model of headache. So the hypothesis was that we can block or inhibit, reduce the headache, but also prevent vasodilation, because we know that the PGA2 can induce vasodilation. So this is a results of the study. You can see the two doses of the EP4 receptor antagonist was investigated, uh, were investigated in this study, 200 milligram and 400 milligram compared to placebo. That was a placebo control. There was no effect. So it failed to inhibit or to block headache. The second set of the data that we have here is on the vascular mechanisms. So here you see the artery diameter. So we were able to measure directly the diameter changes of the superficial temporal artery. And here again, you see that the EP4 receptor antagonist failed to prevent PGE2-induced vasodilation. We still think that PGE2 is interesting. So I'd like to draw your attention on the figure in the left upper corner. When we investigate different molecules inducing migraine, we usually have a in-hospital phase and we have the out of the hospital. We call it immediate phase or delayed phase. Most of the molecules inducing migraine, it takes time, two, three hours on average, you know, when you start developing the migraine attacks. But in case with the PGE2, you can see on the figure, it's almost immediate, okay? In more than 50% of the patients, in fact, almost 80% of the patients. So it seems that this is a very important molecule in terms of the migraine induction. So that's why we still think that it is relevant, although EP4 antagonist is unlikely to be involved, but it's failed, but maybe EP2. And the reason for that is also because, again, it's also involved uh, in the induction of the cyclic AMP. And as a receptor, I think it will be interesting to study that. So we will see whether there will be new drugs targeting this particular receptor so we can test in our human model. Now, we all know about the CGRP, calcitonin gene-related peptide. The reason is that because this peptide is involved in migraine pathophysiology. Another reason is also because we have drugs now uh, antagonizing either CGRP or its receptor, and they are effective in migraine. But the calcitonin family is not only CGRP. It's a group of peptide hormones. They share all structural similarities with the calcitonin, and they include CGRP, amyline, and adrenomedulin. They also have some uh, mechanisms, uh, they also share receptors. So they are formed by association of the calcitonin receptor with so-called receptor activity modifying protein, RAM. And you can also see from this figure that CGRP, for instance, might also act on amyline 1 receptor. And you can also see that adrenaline has also some weak effect on the CGRP specific receptor. So there is something very interesting about these peptides. And uh, what we know from the human models, that the CGRP induces migraine attacks without aura in more than 70% of the patients. And what is interesting, inducing attacks not only in migraine patients with aura, uh, without aura, but also with aura. We also had very few subjects reporting aura after the CGRP. This aspect is very interesting, not yet fully clarified, but we consider CGRP as a strong migraine inducer, inducer without aura. 
Here we have some data from Adrenal Medulin, published last year by Hashmat Kanizada, showing that more than 50% of the patients report migraine attacks after infusion of Adrenal Medulin. He also showed that Pramlintide, which is the amyloid agonist, induces migraine attacks in 41% of the patients. Well, this is very interesting. You can say amyloid, maybe it's not as strong migraine inducer as a, uh, as a CGRP, and also maybe weaker than adrenomedulin. So there is some kind of differences across the studies. Of course, they are not head-to-head -head studies. It's difficult to compare, but what is interesting about the Promlintide study that it was compared in the same group of patients were also provoked with the CGRP. I think one of the presentations, you will hear more about this data. It's very interesting data, with suggesting that there will be something very interesting uh, in the future. Now we know that we have monoclonal antibodies targeting the CGRP or its receptor. We have GPANs, small molecules, antagonist against CGRP receptors, they're also effective. And the next question is whether drugs interacting with adrenomedulin or amyloid receptors will be interesting also to study because there is some prospect also combining of the medications in the future. So just imagine that monoclonal antibodies are effective against CGRP migraine, but not all patients, approximately 60% max 70% of the patients, and those who are not responding may benefit, or this, those who are partial responders might also benefit of the combining of the drugs. The next peptides I'd like to talk about is pituitary adenylate cyclase activating polypeptide PACAP and vasoactive intestinal peptide VIP. They're all Related, they're from the same family. PACAP consists of two isoforms, PACAP 38 and PACAP 27. The first study on PACAP, you can see it on the left, was conducted and published in 2009 by my colleague Henry Schutz, which showed that PACAP 38 induces migraine attacks in more than 50% of the patients. For comparison, no attacks after placebo. Later, we also studied PACAP 27. And in this study, you see that again, more than 50% of the patients also developed attacks after PACAP 27, which is a less distributed or present in the human body compared to the PACAP 38. So the first double blind study showed a clear migraine inducing effect of PACAP. So the next study investigated PACAP38 head-to-head against VIP. Why? Because, as I said before, they're from the same family, they share receptors. It would be interested, interesting to see whether there is any differences in migraine-inducing effect. So here you see that 73% of the patients reported migraine attacks after PACAP38, and only 18% after V. The first question we asked, if they are related and both vasodilators, why we see such a huge difference between these two peptides in the same patient? Well, we looked at the median time from infusion start to onset of migraine, and also on the range. There was no difference. The next step we did, the study also combined uh, induction of migraine with imaging. And in this study, my colleague Faisal Amin investigated arteries using the MRI angiography. And in this uh, study, we measured with the green, you see superficial temporal artery, with the blue, middle meningeal artery, and with the red, middle cerebral artery. You see both peptides this is direct measurements of diameter using the angiography, MRI angiography. Both peptides, no effect on the middle cerebral artery. So if you can use it 
as a surrogate for the blood-brain barrier, you can say, well, both peptides do not really cross the blood-brain barrier, and that's why they don't have effect on the middle cerebral artery. But both of them induce dilation of the superficial temporal artery and middle meningeal artery. But the difference was the duration. Very short-lasting after V and long-lasting after PACAP38. We also have some data showing up to four or five hours after the PACAP38, the arteries are still dilated. Because both peptides share receptors and the PACAP38 has thousand times higher affinity on the PAC1 than V, we suggested that this could be a possible drug target. There's also another interesting receptor, apparently PACAP relevant, whether, it's whether it is involved in humans, we don't know yet, but what is important about this MRGB2 receptor is that it's also associated with uh, muscle degranulation. So we thought, well, this is maybe something interesting we can address because during the infusion of PACAP38 in humans, you see quite pronounced flushing and puff, uh, face puffing, which may suggest that kind of a muscle storm, you might say. So the first, we said, well, maybe this is also drug target. The only way to study right now is based on the background that the delayed middle meningeal artery dilation induced by PACA38 was abolished in mast cell depleted or antihistamine pretreated rats. That was shown in our research park at uh, this hospital in Glostro. And the hypothesis here in this study, in the human study, was pretreatment with the intravenous H1 receptor antagonist clemastine prevents packup induced migraine. So this is the first study I showed you before, showing that the 58% of the patients develop migraine attacks after packup 38. This is a, another study, a clemastine arm, this was a double blind study. You can reduce the migraine induction down to the 25%, but there was also effect of placebo on the pack up uh, induction. And here you see uh, uh, the, the, against the clemastine, you can see 45% of the patients, so less than it was observed previously. So statistically, we didn't find any difference here, but I think it's all about the power and the sample size. In my opinion, there is no doubt that there was some effect of clemastine in reduction uh, of packup induced migraine. So mast cells are involved, very interesting. The next was a phase two randomized double blind placebo control study with the AMG301, that, uh, which was a uh, antibody against PAC1 receptor. And that was uh, investigated for migraine prevention. You see the two different doses of this drug, monoclonal antibody against receptor. One is administrated every two weeks, another every four weeks against the placebo, subcutaneous, and the primary endpoint was monthly migraine days. This study turned to be completely negative. The change from baseline in monthly migraine days for each of these AMG301 dose groups was not different from placebo. What is interesting is about this PAC1 receptor. Apparently, it's present everywhere except cranial arteries. Whether this might explain that, I don't know. Maybe the drug was not potent enough. Maybe you need some splice variants you know, antagonist uh, uh, against the receptor, monoclonal antibodies, we don't know. This is something we'll see and hear in the future. Well, can we block pack up? And the good news is that this is the bad news because the PAC-1 receptor antibody didn't work. And the good news is that we have two currently under development and we will look forward to see the results of this data, whether the monoclonal antibody against PACAP anti-ligand monoclonal antibody would be efficacious for migraine prevention. We don't know. But there is also another interesting aspect. Can we block VIP or its receptor in migraine? Well, to address this issue, 
We have to go back and again see why, PAC, uh, why VIP was so weak in induction of migraine. So the hypothesis was it's all about the very short lasting effect of VIP, in particular on arteries. You can see it here again, I showed you before on the right. And to address this issue, my colleague Lafranco Pelesi conducted this study, randomized clinical trial, effect of the vasoactive intestinal polypeptide on development of migraine headaches. You see the population, intervention, crossover, double blind study, but in contrast to previous study by Faisal Amin, two hours infusion of VIP. Okay, two hours infusion of VIP, which we documented in healthy subjects, was associated with a long lasting dilation of the superficial temporal artery. So in this study, turned to be a very effective in induction, migraine induction. 71% of the patients reported migraine attacks in this study, only 5% of the patients after placebo. That was the statistical difference. So we think that the VIP or its receptors could be very relevant to study for the future migraine drugs. Now, targeting downstream signaling pathways. Here we see the, all the signaling pathways responsible, which I more or less covered all, except the one on the right, you see the glycerol trinitrate, nitroglycerin, which induces migraine attacks in more than 80% of the patients, but by the way, via intracellular mechanisms. And that was later shown also with a sildenafil, which upregulates cyclic GMP, it induces migraine attacks in the same let's say, uh, uh, proportion of the patients, more than 80% of the patients. So there's no, not much difference because you don't need a receptor, you go directly into the cell. But on the left, you see by a G-protein couple receptors, they are less migraine inducer compared to intracellular. You can see also with the celestazole, which is a phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor, which prevents a down-regulation of cyclic AMP by increasing that intracellularly, and you see the migraine induction is in more than 80% of the patients. But one of the important pathways, or, or, or final, or common, you might call it, is ATP-sensitive potassium channels and also large conductance calcium-activated potassium channels, big channels. Why? Because all of them are expressed, both of them are expressed in the micro-relevant structures that I showed you within the trigeminal vascular system. They're activated by several key molecules, including those provoking migraine attacks. And more importantly, that the synthetic ATP channel and big channel openers provoke headache. And that was the reason that the drug development in this field and the hypertension stopped because of the side effect headache. Well, we studied leopromacaline ATP channel opener, which showed that all migraine patients reported migraine attacks. Here you see the median time on onset of migraine-like attacks, three hours. You see that the migraine attacks induced by leopromacaline in terms of the localization were very similar to patients' spontaneous migraine attacks. And on the right, you also see the placebo response with the red showing a median intensity, and all the blacks are individual pain intensity. So it was a quite strong migraine inducer. The second study was uh, targeting of the big channel, and, and here using the opener maxi post. And again, more than 90% of the patients here reported migraine attacks compared to almost nothing uh, to placebo. And the median time onset was the same like it was leptomacalin three hours after. But the range was quite wide because some of the patients also develop attacks immediately, uh, either during the infusion or just right after the infusion. So what we concluded from this study is that opening of the KTP and the big channels causes migraine attacks without aura. And opening of these channels is the strongest provocation of migraine ever studied. I would suggest 
that the blocking of these channels has a new terapeutic target downstream from the signaling molecules. Here's the proposed trigeminal vascular ion channel hypothesis in migraine pathogenesis. We think that the opening of ATP sensitive potassium channels on the vascular smooth muscle cells can be achieved either by direct stimulation or via the narrow peptides or via G protein coupled receptors. And this results with the efflux of potassium, which causes hypopolarization and vasodilation of these arteries. There is nothing new about that. But how can we explain the coupling between the vasodilation and the uh, 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 and the effect uh, on the nociceptors, here we have an issue and problem. If we state that we can directly activate these fibers just by giving the lepromacalib of the big channel opener, it will be unlikely because you would expect the anti nociceptive effect because of simple physiology. But here we think that the activation of the Perivascular trigeminal primary afferents is caused by the increase of the potassium, which synthesizes and discharges these nociceptors. Eventually, all these impulses go to the uh, trigeminal, via trigeminal nerve to the nucleus and then to the uh, supranuclear uh, structures, eventually resulting in the human experience of migraine pain. So this is a hypothesis, of course, and should be tested and proved or disproved. Distribution of the channels, they're everywhere, and you might say, well, maybe it's dangerous to go and block them if we talk about the you know, future uh, drug discovery. Well, the good news is that there is some differences because uh, channels are not just uh, you know, um, homogeneous in terms of their expression and the structure, and we have some uh, hope here that the SUR2B subunit or the QR61 subunit could be a potential for the treatment of migraine because of their localization distribution within the arteries, particular smooth muscle cells, and we're talking about preferentially, of course, the cranial vessels. So the key point of my presentation today is that all signaling molecules involved in the genesis of migraine attack are potent vasodilators. Modulation of the nociceptive transmission by ion channels mainly potassium channels may be a common pathway in the genesis of a migraine attack. And insights from human models of migraine and supportive preclinical data have also provided a basis for the development of the targeted therapies. But very important, not all from the human status have been proven effective for the treatment of migraine. It's something different we can talk about that. And some provide only modest therapeutic benefits, which underscores the whole complexity around the migraine. I'd like to thank funding, funding bodies, for all these studies that I showed you today. And of course, participants, migraine patients, and healthy volunteers who volunteered for all these studies, and my colleagues at the Danish Headache Center Migraine Group. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. My name is Haider. Uh, I am a medical doctor and PhD student at the Danish Headache Center. I will be the moderator now. So uh, if you have any questions, please line up uh, with the micros. Thank you, Mr. for a very nice talk. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. I have two uh, questions. One thing when you say that these studies are conducted in a blind uh, manner, how do you correct for a lot of the physiological responses that you get, for example, from CGRP and adrenal metabolism, such as increasing blood pressure and, uh, and also flushes and this type of things in, uh, in the patients? Yeah, you cannot control with 100%, of course, but uh, that, that is the reason that we do it usually in placebo controlled studies. And uh, even in the placebo-controlled status, you see a so-called nocebo response. That some patients develop uh, migraine attacks or patients develop also headache. So meaning that there is a quite good blinding in terms of the patient's report because this is a very subjective 
It's just based on the symptoms. In terms of the, uh, the vascular responses, uh, the people who conduct you know, all the measurements, they're of course blind for that. And the changes are very small changes. You really see that when you start doing the statistics and data processing. They are not as you know, huge. The only thing that might unmask that is that this kind of flushing, this effect. But again, when you do it in the random order, and, and again, the flushing is also quantifiable because we have a laser speckle for this reason, so we can adjust for that, you know, and this is the best you can get from humans. Oh, um, another one, uh, when it comes to really showing this involvement of this gate feature, have you tried or considered blocking some of these channels and then inducing CGRP to really see that CGRP is linked to these channels uh, in a, a pathological uh, way? This is an excellent question, Christian. I think uh, the problem is that we don't have a really good uh, blocker of the KTP. The only available we have is the glibin clomide. And glibin clomide is very bad. We really tried that. And the reason for that is that uh, because uh, it can give you hypoglycemia and we cannot use the high doses. Maybe you need a high dose. So it's not very good uh, selective blocker of the channel. And, uh, but this is a really interesting question. And I would love to have a, a blocker of the channel and to see whether we can block the CGRP-induced migraine. It's an excellent uh, idea, but not now. So we really, really look forward to finding the, the right blocker. So we can yes, I agree with you. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks. My name is uh, Mohamed Karabuli from the Danish Alex Center. Thank you, Professor Ashina, for the nice presentation. Well, the question is, I really like the most annoying data. Uh, do you think that the immediate headache induced by the Wostonite D2 compared to I2 because of different signaling pathways or because of different anatomical uh, substrate for migraine attacks? Because we saw that there, there was immediate migraine attacks after E2 compared to I2. So, and, and the second question is, are we going to see stratification of migraine after the uh, uh, signaling pathway that uh, is involved in migraine attacks in the future? Thank you for your question, Mohammed. For the first question is that there could be a receptor distribution differences between the prostacycline and the PGE2. So you're, you're probably implying for this that could be differences in terms of the distribution and expression of these receptors, and that's why we get. But I, I don't think so. I think that this idea of the immediate headache is a bit tricky. We need to study it more, uh, more in head-to-head -head comparison in the same patients. Because you also see with the KTP channel opener, you did the studies, some of the patients also develop attacks immediately. But still, there is more towards the immediate response in case with uh, PGE2. So this could be that this receptor probably causes, uh, uh, you know, uh, quite fast activation of the intracellular mechanisms compared to other. Maybe their distribution is uh, different, and that's why more widely spread in the trigeminal vascular system. We'll look at the preclinical status. We didn't really see the big differences between them, because they're expressed everywhere. But again, this kind of extrapolation of data is very difficult, because they're from preclinical, and what we see in the humans, not everything we can explain. Number two is that whether we have a distribution in terms of the, uh, or different expression of migraine based on the different molecules. So migraine could be a KTP migraine, migraine could be a nitric oxide migraine or other. It's also a very interesting idea, uh, suggesting that migraine is a very heterogeneous in this term. But I think, I think it's all about the threshold. Because we used to say that the CGRP is something maybe for one particular group of migraine patients, 60 to 70 percent of the patient. But when we studied the CGRP, in chronic migraine patients, uh, you know, Afrim uh, and Henrik Schutz, they did it, almost more than 90% of the patients develop migraine attacks after the CGRP infusion, suggesting that it's all about the threshold, you know, where the threshold is. So it is a nice idea to have a different migraines 
but I'm not sure about that. So can I? <coughs> well, the, the, last, the last question here for me is, so if you get the patients in the high threshold, or, or excuse me, the low threshold, then you would expect that you would use migraine attacks in all of them using whatever of these models we saw. Yeah, but, yeah, you might say you might say so because uh, you know some years ago, uh, 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 Yes and his group they showed even in the healthy subjects, you know, if you do a long-lasting infusion or exposure to nitric oxide, even those, you know, apparently migraine-free, uh, you know, participants they start developing some kind of migraine features, suggesting that it could be all about the threshold. Like you have a threshold for seizures, right? You can induce seizure in anyone. So maybe we can be very provocative now and say we can induce migraine in everyone if you need, if you have a strong enough, let's say, trigger, right? But I know that you did it with the lepromocaline in healthy subjects, and they didn't develop migraine attacks. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for a very excellent presentation. Thank you. You have lovely. Answer my question about this again. Uh, if you have CKP or antagonist, it's only 10 to 20 percent who are pain free. It's the highest open event is out below 10. Is it so to expect them to be so with all specific drugs? And they, yeah. they are only effective in that way. So Pierre's question is more or less about the, how we can, in, how we see the pathophysiology in context of the treatment response. So if CGRP is important, how can we explain, uh, uh, let's say, relative uh, modest effect of the small molecules, right? Uh, I think uh, it could be for reasons that bioavailability, because it is a bit special, in comparison, again, going back to, again to Professor Ulison's study showing that the Orsigipan was quite effective when it was, it was given intravenously, right? Yes, please correct me. It went up almost to the 80% of the subjects, uh, you know, pain, pain free, right? Yeah. So, so it's all the debatable, right? Now, it's, uh, like we know that if you start comparing the, the tablets, I agree with you that the triptans. Uh, seems to be more effective, although we don't have a direct comparison status against the, the current GPANs that we have. We have, so for the old GPAN, for Telke GPAN, if I remember correctly there, there was a, almost, not, not as good as a Rhizotriptan or a Elitriptan, but still quite good, in, by the numbers, better than the, the current ones. Yeah. 5% so whether we can expect the same, let's say, uh, efficacy, you know, uh, with a new target is difficult to say. You might speculate that. But I think the good thing about the migraine and science in our field is that by, by developing a new drugs, we are expanding our armamentarium. So, so we can actually see also those who are not responding to the previously developed drugs, such like triptans, might respond also for the other drugs. Uh, with monoclonal antibodies with the CGRP against CGRP, it seems to be they're very good, right? At least you can say if you are very critical, as good as the previously used drugs, right? Uh, but they're not bad at all. And, but they are used as a preventive, not as an acute. So maybe there is a difference how you use the medication, you know, against this particular receptor or this particular channel as a preventive or as a, we know that triptans, cannot really be used as a preventive. If we start taking the triptans every day, you know, we will develop a medication that will use headache. So there is a difference a bit between the different molecules, and, and we will expect also to see the difference in terms of the, the efficacy. One last question. Do you expect that in the future, 10 years, 20 years, they should have a combination of different drugs to be effective? The future perspective on combination of different blockers is very interesting. I mentioned briefly about the amyline and, uh, uh, and the CGRP, uh, so in this context, the uh, dual therapy. Uh, I'm 
I'm personally a bit critical about the combinations. I'm more for the monotherapy because it's very difficult to show uh, the or to claim efficacy based on your clinical experience. But I would accept that immediately if somebody conduct a randomized clinical trial properly controlled in terms of the power, efficacy, etc., and show that the combination really is better than that. So far, the combinations, at least we know with the beta blocker and topiramate, was not quite successful when you do the clinical trials. But in clinical practice, I know some of my colleagues are doing that. So in the future, with the new drug targets, more selective, let's say in terms of the mechanism based, I would not exclude that. Maybe CGRP antibody, and if pack up antibodies effective, could be combined. This is possible. And now we have a question from uh, Professor Aynor. Do you think, Mr. Uh, that specific effects of neurodegenerative uh, vascular unit depend on the age uh, of any effects uh, or the mechanisms? Well, this is a very interesting but tough question to, to, to answer because uh, in fact that we, we, uh, we are now writing a, a paper on this topic uh, a bit. Uh, not exactly this topic, but this topic is also included and Dr. Doe knows about that. So we know that uh, migraine evolves over the years, the lifespan. So it becomes less, uh, less intense and also goes down in terms of the frequency. And sometimes you see a long-lasting remission. Whether this is something to do with some uh, the changes, the morphological changes, we don't know. So we don't have data on that. We we'll look at the from the different literature, you know, from the different fields, it seems that there is also evolution in this context, but whether it can be extrapolated and applied in migraine, we don't know. And the last question, I think, from Mona. Yes, thank you. Thank you for a nice presentation. So, I'm just interested in how these migraine subgroups, so migraine, menstrual migraine, migraine autonomic symptoms, do you expect that there will be more and more of these targeted towards Specific Yeah, the targeting different end endophenotypes is very interesting. Uh, just going to give you one example that with a PAC1 receptor antibody, which failed for migraine prevention, we also looked at the subtype of patients self reporting autonomic symptoms. Uh, because PAC is also distributed in the parasympathetic nervous system. We just speculated maybe it is more efficacious in this subgroup of patients. We didn't see that. But I'm quite critical about that because how can we be sure about these self-reported symptoms, how they're reproducible? There is a huge field of first of mapping these patients. When these patients are mapped in terms of the clear-cut criteria, like we have it with a migraine currently criteria, migraine with and without, you know, uh, uh, migraine with photophobia, uh, phonophobia or nausea, etc. So when we have more, more or less robust criteria, then we can start looking at these subtypes. I know that you're involved in this field, so, so we're all excited to hear about that. Uh, I, I think that this is something in the future. Uh, we have a clear subtypes, aura and without aura. But what about other subtypes? We don't know. The menstrual migraine, a bit more critical, again, pure menstrual migraine, my clinical experience, it's quite rare, it's not so frequent. So meaning that the patient experience attacks exclusively during the menstrual cycle. The menstrual related, yes, but there are a lot, the menstrual related uh, uh, attacks. So, but this is an interesting perspective. Thank you for asking this question. We have also another question from the online participants. Uh, you mentioned that there is a difference between headache induction in migraine with aura and migraine without aura patients. Do you think the pathophysiological processes to induce headache in these migraine types are different? Excellent question uh, from, uh, from Dr. Karatash. Uh, thank you for asking this question. Uh, uh, I think there is, there is some, I mean, some data suggesting that the mechanisms could be distinct. Uh, at least for the cortical spread depression. Currently, we don't have any evidence that the cortical spread depression, which is a, a 
the physiological phenomenon that uh, explains the aura symptoms also uh, present in migraine without aura. So you might, based only on this, you can say, well, maybe it's a different. Even the old studies many years ago conducted uh, uh, by Ullison uh, and colleagues showing that the flow changes, pathognomonic changes for the aura was not present in migraine patients without aura. So this field is still open, we don't know, but please stay tuned because we have a very interesting presentation later today by Dr. Al Karakoli, you know, discussing a little bit the differences between the aura and headache, especially relationship between the headache and aura. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you.